Hey coach, uh, I'm so happy you found us. Make sure you subscribe down below, hit the bell up above, leave some comments. We'll always respond to those. Um, also go over and check out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better. If you're looking for resources, if you're looking for to become a better basketball coach, if you're looking for that one-stop shop, that roadmap, teachhoops.com down below is the answer for you. Have a great day. Hey, Dr. Dish fam. I am super excited to introduce one of our favorite partners and skills trainer, Shane Hennen yeah. from Hennen Workouts. Shane, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it. You, know, yeah. you actually drove in, yep. right? That's a crazy thing. It's our first snowfall here. Yep, drove summer. right through that snowstorm. How was the trip? How does it feel to be back in your uh, home state? It feels good, man. We don't have any uh, snow in Iowa, so to see some snow actually made me pretty happy, just yeah. being from Minnesota and being used to it. So That's right. That's yeah, great. it's good to be here, man. Cool. Awesome. Well, we're so excited to have you, and you know, we've got a number of questions just about your yeah. journey, and um, it, it's obviously been a pretty long one, right? You've been yeah. around the game of basketball most of your whole life. And yeah. um, for our Dr. Dish fam, they probably know you at Hen and Workouts, yeah. right, on yeah. social media. So we'll be sure to drop all those links in the description, tag you, all that good stuff. But tell the Dr. Dish fam a little bit more about your journey, kind of how yeah. your love of the game developed, your high school career, your college sure. career, and how you kind of transitioned into uh, what you're doing now. Yeah, so I grew up in a very small town, uh, Ghent, Minnesota, and went to school in Minneota, which is also very small, very near to Aaron. So uh, Southwest Minnesota, small town, not a lot of resources, but I had my dad and my dad was awesome. He was a farmer, had very little time because, you know, being a farmer is a grind. Yeah. Uh, so we had a little hoop in our driveway and the way I got introduced to basketball was just my dad playing with me in the yard cool. and showing me who Kevin Garnett was. And mm -hmm. then I was at the elbow doing fadeaways like Kevin Garnett and I was trying to reimagine myself being these people. So yes. I think the most important thing for me now as a trainer is to take some of that, some of the stuff that my dad did with me as far as just teaching me to appreciate the game and love the game. He would bring me to the high school games and I look at these players and I'm like, these are the best players in the world, you know? So um, I really had a very healthy introduction to the game, which I think um, made me fall in love with it. So um, had a great high school career, scored a ton of points, went to a, a small NAI school um, and got my butt kicked right away and started to learn how, you know, the difference between college and high school and how to fit a role and, you know, you're not going to be the best player. Sure. Um, and it was a grind, man. It, it taught me, to be honest with you, <clears throat> the basketball experience was great, but like the overall experience of uh, just growing up and becoming a man and having discipline and having um, hard discipline um, people around you and holding you accountable was very, very valuable to me. So it's been a good mixture of like my basketball journey as far as my playing experience, good mixture of, you know, me falling in love with the game, growing, being successful, being challenged, failing and succeeding, yep. and then uh, just kind of learning the ins and outs of how this works. So um, yeah, that's how I started. When I got done playing college, I played four years there. Um, we had great, great teams, went to some tournaments, um, and then I got into training. And that's kind of where I started. So um, I had a normal job when I got out of uh, got out of college and did some basketball stuff on the side, and it just kind of blossomed into a, a career. So yeah. that's where I'm at. Well, that's great, and that's kind of what I was going to ask because we were just talking before this interview of how you yeah. kind of transitioned from what yeah. you kind of call more of a regular job, yep. right? Of you got your degree, yeah. you're doing some things, but talk to us a little bit about you know how you made that transition, yeah. how you got into training, and what it was like kind of turning your passion for the game into an actual real business. Yeah, you know what? Coming from a small area, and I think anybody that comes from smaller towns can um, attest to this. It's you know when you grow up, the idea is you get a, a job, right? Something that's a career that has benefits, all these things, and. When I first got out of college, I joined a marketing agency and I remember being there and it was exciting because it was new, but I remember just like the long days and I felt like I really wasn't doing much and I was like, okay, I'm going to coach these kids afterwards and I'm super excited about it. And I just like, I had no idea what I was doing, you know, and in college, like they try to prepare you, but when, yeah. until you start working, you really don't know. So I'm getting this, this career experience and I'm realizing like, okay, something about me and the way I'm made doesn't fit into like this perfect, like work from this hour to this hour, get this much done. I was like, if I'm passionate about something, I'll work and I'll grind and I'll grind and I'll, I'll make something of it. So um, this marketing agency, basically they closed down, they got bought out and they said, okay, you can, uh, you can apply for a job at this other place that bought us out. And they had some good positions, but I, I just really love basketball mm -hmm. so much. And I, I've grown to like love teaching kids and I got to know these families. And uh, I basically reached out to the gym I was working for and said, hey, if there's any opportunities for me to make a little bit more income, I'd love to kind of get into this world a little bit more. <clears throat> and God bless them, they, they gave me some uh, opportunities to make some more money. I said, look, I'll clean the gym, I'll clean the bathrooms, I'll literally do whatever. I just want to be in this industry. Right. Um, 
so that's kind of how I started. I, I took a step away from that. My parents were like, oh my goodness, like yeah. what, you know, this is all right now for now, but you should be looking at maybe doing something else, wow. which is funny to me because I still get those questions and those looks sometimes when I tell people like, yeah. I work in basketball, this is what I do. I film stuff, I work with kids, I do all these things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I started. I, I had a normal job and uh, realized maybe that structure wasn't for me and uh, kind of just put myself in the basketball industry and just went all in. Really yeah. cool just seeing how far you've come. Yeah. But talk about that piece of content. So we'll certainly share it, we'll link yeah. to it. But just explain kind of the synopsis of, you know, we were talking mm -hmm. about this too, of people think basketball facilities and all yeah. the gyms are very permanent, yeah. right? But for you, it was a little different. Very so explain different. the process of maybe how you identified your space, really quick what the steps yeah. were of going from idea yeah. to actually having kids in your gym training. Well, I think it goes back to being engulfed in the industry. Obviously, you'll see AAU programs, you'll see tournaments, you see other private trainers and kind of how they operate, how they make money. And, uh, you know, as a beginning trainer, I think the biggest issue is gym space. And it's like, where am I going to do my business at? Because either you're renting space for a high dollar amount or you have access to a gym that only gives you a couple hours, a couple days. And it's like a big headache for a lot of people. And uh, you have to start that way. But eventually you want your own space just for, you know, just to be able to relax and say, I don't have to go through anybody to, to get this space. I can just go in whenever I want. So um, my idea was like, <clears throat> okay. You know, I, I know a lot of kids have resources where they play AAU, they play high school, they have all these other places they can go, but there's not a place that's not affiliated with anything. So I'm not, I'm not your high school coach, I'm not your AAU coach, I'm not anybody that's recruiting you, I'm literally just a resource for you to come in, get better, then you can leave. Yeah. And when I, when I realized that, um, I understood like it doesn't matter what the space technically looks like or how much space there is. If you can get them results, they'll keep coming back. And if you supply an environment where they feel like mistakes are okay, and nobody's here to judge me, nobody's here to cut my playing time, nobody's here to do any of that. I can just go to this place, I can go work out with Shane mm -hmm. in this little shed, right? And I can grow. So a big part of it was just me creating an environment where players felt like it was okay for them to make mistakes and to grow. Um, and like we were talking about, a, a space, when people think about that, they're like, oh, I gotta go get a plot of land, I gotta build three courts, full courts, college, whatever. And it's just not, Business-wise, it's not the smartest thing because then you're stuck like running tournaments, you're stuck hosting events that you really didn't want to do anyway. So basically what I did is I found a warehouse space that literally was a diesel mechanic shop before that. So there's like, when I went toured the space, there was like truck and oil and all this stuff everywhere. It's so good. It was hilarious. And I'm it's like, so oh funny. yeah, I think I can make this a gym space. And the guy was looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we just, we, we measured all like the square footage and what we had. And um, I had a buddy uh, that I leaned on that was an engineer and just said, hey, can you draw up some lines that would fit in this space and tell me what it would look like? Yeah. And uh, it worked, you know? And for me as a, a business owner that was just starting, mm -hmm. um, it was so low expense because of the space, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, basically we just, we turn in a, a small tight space into a training environment where all of these kids and high level players started showing up. And it was great. And it, you know, there's spaces that are surrounding that spot that you know, were much better, much bigger, had better resources, um, but the kids weren't going there. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was awesome. Um, I'm excited to, to do another one in, in Des Moines, Iowa. So yeah, yeah we're excited. No, that's amazing. And yeah, I think that's a great testament to that. You don't have to, right. I mean, fitting for your scenario, you don't have to bet the farm, right? You can exactly. just a small plot of land. Yep. If you can make a diesel warehouse work, if you're watching this video, don't think that you can't find the space for you. Exactly. Me. Shane's living proof of that. Yep. So for you, what was the biggest challenge? Was it the space? I know you said for a lot of you know, trainers, creators, the space is a, a factor. It didn't sound yeah. like that was too big of a hurdle for you. Right. Um, but what were just some general, when you think of you know, things that were in the way when you were building your business to get to where you are now, what were yeah. some of the challenges you had to overcome? Um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me was finding a mentor. Uh, finding somebody that was in my industry that was doing this at a high level. And I didn't know that I needed a mentor until I met one. Mm -hmm. um, and when I met a man, it would like change the game for me. Like it was somebody that I could talk to that had experience in everything. Um, so, and he was a couple years ahead of me. So seeing like where he failed and he would talk to me about how that happened. And then his success, success stories was like yeah. super beneficial. So if I'm a beginning guy, beginning trainer, the biggest thing I would say is find a mentor that is in the industry. Um, doesn't have to be somebody famous, but somebody that you respect sure. and just start talking to them and pick their brain as much as possible. I think one of the biggest challenges for trainers or any skill development coach, one is the space, but two is um, how do I get clients? Um, how do I keep them? Uh, how do I get them result, uh, uh, results? Um, so a lot of that was that, was 
Um, I got clients, uh, and the way to keep them around is obviously to create a safe environment for them to train, but also to get them results, mm. to make sure that they are, uh, you know, performing well in games because that's really what matters. So that was the biggest hurdle was like, one, you have to get those clients, but two, you got to make sure that they want to keep coming back and they're seeing benefits in training with you. So as it relates to, you know, being a good teammate or when you look at things other than scoring, filling yeah. up the stat sheet, like what advice do you give players about just how to be a better teammate, oh how to contribute, goodness. even if they're not, you know, the next D1 player. Or you the know next what? In, in, high in high school, it was so hard because you're good, right? If you're one of those really good players in high school, it's, you don't know how to be a good teammate until you are humbled a little bit. And when I got to college and I was like, holy cow, I got to add some weight. You know, I got to get faster. I got to, my skills that I thought were good, that there's four other people that are better than me in my position. So, mm. um, you know, even, even when you do improve, improve those things, like one thing I wanted to do when I was a freshman after I had that experience was like, most of the kids would go home and I desperately wanted to go home because I loved being back home. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to stay in the city. I'm not going to miss a lifting thing. I'm not going to miss anything. When I'm done with my four years, I'm going to make sure I don't have any regrets. Like, oh, I should have stayed that summer and then I might have had this. I made sure that I showed up to everything. And even when you do that, right, even when you show up to everything, you work hard, it doesn't guarantee you really anything. That's almost like the bare minimum of what is required from you. Totally. Showing up, working hard, that's what everybody can do. So I would be doing those things, right? And I'm like, well, I stayed here all summer. I did all these things like, okay, it's time to play. And it just didn't happen right away. It took even longer. And in that moment, I realized like, look, Shane, in order for you to be happy, you can't always be relying on being on the floor, scoring a million points. It's just like, that's not how this level is gonna play out for you. Yeah. So I realized like, okay, I have best friends that are playing. I wanna support them. I wanna show coach that, you know, even though I'm not playing, I'm still proud to be on this team um, because we're good. So I'd be standing up and clapping. Um, I'd, be the, I'd be the guy at practice that would purposely pick the best player and guard them. Mm. So I'd be doing all these things just to kind of, one, prove to the coach that I am trying, but also like, even though I'm not getting opportunities that I feel like I want, um, there's other things that I can do to produce value. And, yeah. and it wasn't until then that I really realized like, how to be a supportive teammate and then what team actually means. Because when you're the best player, you feel like, okay, this is all on my shoulders. I'm doing all these things, yeah, like give me a water, like all these things, right? Yeah. And until you're the guy that's getting the best player of the water, right? Yeah. And supporting them and telling them like, hey, this is what I'm seeing or just clapping, yeah. it's hard to know. So um, it's a lesson I learned uh, when I got to college, when I was humbled, when I was surrounded by players that were better than me, it was like, this is, now's the time to learn what it means to be on a team and how to be a good teammate. Yeah, no, that's, that's so cool. And yeah, I mean, all that stuff, right? Like, yeah. not everybody can be the one getting served. There has to be people doing the serving. And well, you know what? To be honest, too, when I go back to school, nobody knows. Like, they all know me because I was a part of the program. Sure. So they're all like, what's up, Shane? Like, how you doing? Where you? Like, they all, you know, you go back to those situations, and since there was a team environment, you were a good teammate, you left a good imprint on these people, you leave with some respect from these people. So when you go back, they, you're just another one of the guys. Like, you could have scored 2,000 points or five points. Right. Nobody really cares, yep. right? Because at that point, it's past that. It's like a brotherhood. It's, it's a respect thing. Like, you did this with us. You lasted four years. You were there for us. We were there for you. Yep. So it's, it's very special to me. What would you say when you start thinking about things like setting goals, yeah. right? Like obviously what you're doing, you're working with a lot of players yeah. and those players, they might be working with you frequently. They might be working with you just occasionally. So it probably becomes pretty important, like having very specific goals yeah. of what they're trying to achieve and how they're going to get there. Yeah. What role does goal setting play in your business? Yeah. And how can young players or players of any age take what you've learned about goal setting and apply it to their games? Yeah, I think that's one of the very first conversations I have with parents is when their kids come in, it's like, okay, what are some things we're struggling with? And uh, like I said, of course we want to cover everything um, and work on all these encompassing skills that kind of uh, bleed all together. Uh, but having those one or two or three goals that, uh, that we can set is very, very important because it gives you this clear path of like, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and even before that, uh, what's more important is after you understand the issue, there has to be a belief that I can overcome this. Mm -hmm. If you do not have the belief, it's just not gonna happen. Like you can just go in the gym and work on all this stuff, but at the end of the day, if you're not confident in what you're trying to do, the results are not gonna come. So I think even more important than some of those goals is one, understanding like, okay, this is the issue that's, you know, that I have at hand. This is what I need to do, but I have to believe that if I work on this or if I go this direction, I can actually accomplish it. So, um, you know, from my, you know, from my experience, one of the biggest things, like I said, was my dad giving me that mentality of like, why not you? You can do this if you want. Yeah. And, uh, that's what I would tell people. If you're going to set goals, there also has to be time um, spent on 
just believing in what you can accomplish. Sure. So, yeah, not just all the, the physical skills. Training. Right. You got to work on your mind too. Hundred percent. So I wanted to ask you this question specifically because I see you as someone who you're crazy about the content. Yeah. And we talked about just that balance, even of a business owner, right? Of you want to create content, but you also have a yeah. client list and players and parents who are For counting sure. on you. So I think that players watching this are in that same boat, right? Yeah. Maybe they want to utilize social media or they love social media. Can you just talk about what you see from yeah. your lens of you're training all these players of maybe how you see social media fitting into the game and maybe mm. what some dangers are yeah. of things that kids might want to be you know, cautious of or just be aware of when they're posting on TikTok, Instagram, all right. that. I think uh, you know, for me, where I make my most income currently, and I think a lot of trainers will say this, is the on-court training. So in order for me to, one, have space, have more time in my schedule, I have to do those things um, to set myself up. Uh, social media is a major, major resource, and it's a very important tool, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, you know, reasoning of how I got into places, um, why I'm here, why I you know, you know, have met a lot of people, is because they've seen my stuff. Yeah. So it's tough because you don't always see a direct impact of your social stuff, you see that kind of later and it plays out over time. Right. I think uh, balancing as a trainer or as a player, if I needed to train kids in person or if I was a player that had to work out and spend time developing, it is a tough balance. Um, and there's gonna be days where you have to say, this has to go down a little bit and this has to go up. Right. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. There's not like a perfect recipe for anybody. So I think where where the art is and where the skill level is, is that, is the sliding of the scale. How much do I slide the scale towards business, towards working out? And then how much do I slide back this way? Where do I put that? I think your evaluation of your time, your day, how much resources you have is important. Um, so as a kid, if I was looking to produce a lot of content, I think that's great. I think growing your brand right now is like, it's something that I wish I would have done earlier because it does take time. Um, I would do it in a fashion where uh, there's respect tied to it and you're not doing or putting anything out that's disrespectful to anybody, but more talking about you, your journey, what you're trying to accomplish, uh, maybe some stuff that you know. I think that's all valuable and I think it can help a lot of people. So um, growing your brand is important, but doing it the right way I think is, is more important. Yeah, no, that's really good and I think a message that players yeah. can't hear enough, right? Yeah. Especially not from their coach or their parents. For sure. From someone like you who's just in the business of skill development. So just tell us a little bit about how has the Dr. Dish kind of changed yeah. your training practice and how has it, you know, changed the way that you and your players work, to get, it's work been, out together? It has been great. Um, to be honest with you, it's, it's like one of those things that you look at it and you're like, okay, that is a resource that I could use that would be helpful. But really what it is, it can change a lot of things. It can change a player's, literally change a player's life in, a, in their game. It can also change the way you run your business. From a business standpoint, it's very helpful because I can put a player on that with a design workout that I know exactly what they need and they can come in whenever they want and just hammer it out. And it's beautiful. And that's something that I think is very important is, is one, giving players a resource to work out, right? And to teach them some things, but also like, it's important for that player to know how to work themselves out, mm. right? And to put their own workouts in the dish and to be able to get their own shots up. I think that's huge. So I've just seen so many benefits from, from, the, uh, from the machine mm. and uh, I'm super happy that I, ha I have it in our facility. Um, I'm, I'm happy for this continued relationship with you guys. And uh, I think for any player, man, if it, one of the biggest things is reps and I have yet to find a better way to get high quality reps. Mm. So. Um, yeah, it serves its purpose in so many different ways. I think more than what people think. Okay, so we're going to kind of go a different direction. I'm gonna hit you with a speed round. All right. So these are quick, off the cuff questions. Oh, no. I'm just gonna hit you with a bunch of basketball questions. Yeah. And this is it. the last one. So okay. let her rip here and, and we'll, we'll I gotta this answer up. quickly? You gotta answer quickly. <clears throat> All right. All right, the first question. What's the biggest mistake that training, that players who are training make? Hoopers. Not consistent. That was easy. All right, um, most undertaught skill in the game of basketball? Footwork. Footwork. LeBron or Jordan? Ooh, <laughs> my wife's gonna literally hate me. Uh, uh, LeBron. LeBron. So who's gonna be in the final four this year, NCAA? Oh, probably KU. Uh, hmm, I can see Duke there. I can see Kentucky there. Villanova? Those are safe picks, right? Always safe picks. <laughs> Game of one-on-one -on -one basketball, you and Bjorn Broman, who wins? Oh my goodness, Bjorn, I have the height advantage, he can shoot, I'm just gonna take him to the post, so I'm gonna take me. 
All right, we might have to make that one happen. <laughs> All right, this All is, respect, Bjorn. <laughs> this is a little bit of a different lightning round. I'm going to name a bunch of NBA guys. You tell me overrated, underrated. Oh, I love this. All right, I saw this guy in your Instagram story the other night. I'm excited about this one. Carl Anthony Towns. Oh, my God, we're in Minnesota. <laughs> Listen, Kat, I love you. A little bit overrated right now. All right, a guy who broke the hearts of many Timberwolves fans, Jimmy Butler. <sighs> underrated, for sure. A guy who hurts. has had a tough NBA career thus far, Julius Randle. Uh, I think properly rated, maybe a little bit overrated, but properly rated is what I would say. Fair enough. Desmond Bain. Underrated for sure. Guy's good. That guy is really good. <laughs> Last one, Gordon Hayward. Uh, properly rated now, underrated in his prime. Awesome. Well, I will stop there, Shane, but honestly, it's a yeah. pleasure not only to work with you, but just to watch how you're changing the game. And yeah. I know that for you, you really have a passion for taking this thing to the next level. Yeah. So if you guys don't already, follow Shane at Hennon Workouts on all social medias. Shane, again, we're super proud to call you a partner. And Thank you. Can't wait to keep growing the game with you. I'm excited. Appreciate it. Hey coach, so glad you enjoyed the video. Subscribe and like and go over and check out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better.